Welcome back to this series on graph theory. Last time we defined trees, and this time we're going to look at ways of characterizing trees. So we're going to give uh, four equivalent ways to look at a tree. Before starting, let's quickly recall the definition of a tree. So we defined a tree to be an acyclic connected graph. As we'll see, there are other concise ways of expressing that a graph is a tree, which are equivalent to this definition. This is the content of the following theorem, which states that the following are equivalent. for a graph t. The first point is that t is a tree. So that's using the above definition that t is an acyclic and connected graph. The second point is that any two vertices of t are connected by a unique path. The third point states that T is minimally connected. This means that T itself is connected, but if we remove any edge in T, then it becomes disconnected. And the fourth point is similar, which is saying that T is maximally acyclic. This means that T is an acyclic graph, but if we add any edge into t, then after t becomes cyclic. So these four ways of looking at a tree give different perspectives. So the first one is using two properties. So if t is a tree according to the definition, it's acyclic and connected. The second point doesn't talk about the graph being acyclic or connected. Instead, it uh, talks about paths in the graph. So it's saying that any two vertices of t are connected by a unique path. And we'll see that the fact that there is a path between two vertices, well, that's the connectivity aspect, and the fact that there's only one corresponds to the acyclicity aspect of the tree t. Now, the third point talks only about connectivity. However, there's this minimality condition. So it's saying that t is connected, but if we remove any edge, then it's no longer connected. And so the minimality here in this uh, point corresponds to the fact that uh, T is acyclic. And finally, there's sort of the, the opposite in point four, where we're talking about acyclicity. However, we're including a maximality aspect. So if T is maximally acyclic, that means if we add any edge, then it's no longer acyclic, then this will imply the connectivity of the graph. Hence, we can see that there's sort of a trade-off between a graph being connected and a graph being acyclic, and trees are exactly sort of on the balancing point of, of this trade-off. And this will become clearer when we, when we move on to the proof. As a first step, let's show that the point 1 implies point 2. So we suppose that T is a tree, which means that it's acyclic and connected. And now we want to show that any two vertices of T are connected by a unique path. So we let U and V be vertices of T. Now because T is connected, by definition, there exists a path between the vertices u and v. So the fact that t is connected implies that there is a path p going from u to v. So the only thing we need to show now is that there can't be more than one such path. So assume there is another path from u to v with q being distinct from the other path p. So I'll make a sketch of this situation. We can draw the path p in red. So we start at u and then the path goes to v. 
and maybe we can draw Q in purple. So Q also starts at U, and it might follow along the same way as P goes, but at some point it has to diverge from P because it's a distinct path. And then it might intersect P at several points, but eventually it has to end up at V. All right, so we let X be the first vertex where P and Q um, diverge from each other. Such a vertex X has to exist because P and Q are distinct. Another way of finding this vertex X is moving along the path P until we find a vertex that is no longer part of Q. So at some point there has to be such a vertex because Q and P are distinct. And now we just take the vertex that's immediately before that, and that's our vertex x. Next we find another special vertex y, which is the first point that the paths rejoin after they've diverged for the first time. Again, this vertex has to exist because at some point q and p have to rejoin. At the latest, they would rejoin at the vertex v. So another way of finding this uh, vertex y would be to start at x, which we've established exists, and then proceed along p until at some point we reach a vertex which is again uh, in q. And the first such vertex after x uh, we just call y. And again, this vertex y has to exist because at the latest p and q rejoin at the vertex v, which is the endpoint of both of the paths. All right, so we've found these two special vertices, x and y, with x being the first point where the paths diverge, and y being the first point where they rejoin after this initial divergence. Now, by the way that we've defined x and y, there are no vertices um, between x and y along p or along q, where the two paths intersect. Because suppose that we had some vertex, say z, here, where these paths uh, intersect. Well then, actually, we would have chosen z as our point y. So in fact, such a z can't exist, because otherwise it would be our vertex y. Now here's where we get the contradiction, because we've now found some uh, subpath of p from x to y um, which I've marked in yellow, and we've also found a subpath of Q from X to Y, which I'll mark in green. And moreover, these two subpaths don't intersect, and this means that they form a cycle. Hence, we found this cycle in T. But T was assumed to be acyclic, so this whole thing is a contradiction, and in fact, we can't have two distinct paths um, from u to v. Next we'll show that point 2 implies point 3. So we suppose 2 holds. That is, given any two vertices in T, they are connected by a unique path. And now we want to show that T is minimally connected. So again, that means that if we remove any edge from T, then it's no longer connected. So we let E be any edge in T. So we can draw this edge E, and it'll connect vertices X and Y in T. Now by assumption, for any two vertices in T, there's a unique path connecting them. And in particular, if we choose the vertices x and y, which are the endpoints of this edge, there is a unique path between them. But now because x and y are connected by this edge, and this edge is in fact a path, we know that there can't be any other path um, between x and y that is not this edge E. This means that E is the only path between x and y. And so removing E from the graph will disconnect X from Y. And this shows that point two implies three. 
Now let's show that 3 implies 4. And we'll do this by showing the contrapositive. So we suppose that 4 does not hold. So I'll write this not 4, which means that t is not maximally acyclic. Hence, there exist vertices x and y such that if we add the edge xy, so t plus xy, then this is still acyclic. That statement is just what it means for t to be not maximally acyclic. Let's make a drawing for this. So we have some vertices x and y that do not have an edge between them in t. And now we can add this red edge xy and obtain a graph which is still acyclic. Now the claim is that there's no path um, between x and y in our original graph t. Well, suppose there were such a path, so we would have some path p going between x and y. Now we know that the edge xy is not part of our original graph t, so it can't be part of the path p. But this also means that if we now add the edge xy, then we obtain a cycle, which I'm now drawing in yellow, in t plus xy. So this yellow thing is a cycle in t plus xy. However, we assumed that t plus xy was acyclic, so this is a contradiction. Hence, there can't be such a path p. So this shows this claim that there's no paths between x and y in t. However, now this also means that t is not connected because there are no paths between x and y. And so in particular, t can't be minimally connected because t being minimally connected at least requires that t is connected. So the fact that t is not connected implies that property 3 does not hold. Thus in total we've shown that if property 4 does not hold, then property 3 does not hold either, and this is logically equivalent to the fact that 3 implies 4, and so we've shown 3 implies 4. Finally, let's show that property 4 implies property 1, which will then close the, the loop of implications and will show the equivalences. For this we suppose that t is maximally acyclic, and we need to now show that t is in fact a tree. Well, what does it mean for t to be a tree? Well, it means that it's acyclic and connected. But we already know that t is acyclic because we're assuming it's maximally acyclic. So in fact, we just need to show that t is connected. We again do this by contradiction. So we assume that we have vertices x and y in t that were not connected. So this means that there's no, no xy path in t. Let's draw this picture. So we have vertices x and y, and there's no path between x and y. Now we consider the graph we obtain from t by adding the edge xy. And we claim that t plus xy is acyclic. Why is this the case? Well, suppose we have some cycle in t plus xy. Now because we know that t itself is acyclic, it means that the introduction of the edge xy has to have created this cycle, which means that the edge xy has to be part of the cycle. So the cycle that we have in t plus uh, xy needs to include this edge xy. So this is a cycle C. 
However, now we see that we have this path between x and y that goes along the part of C that uh, does not contain the edge xy. And this yellow path is in fact part of T. So this is a path in T. But by assumption, we assume that there's no xy path in T, and now we found an xy path in T, and this is a contradiction. So in fact, this cycle C can exist in the graph T plus xy, which shows that T plus xy is acyclic. All right, but this fact, well, that this claim is true, is again a contradiction because we assume that T was maximally acyclic. So this means that if we add any edge, then we get a graph that is no longer acyclic. And here we found some edge, namely the edge xy, that if we add it, then after the graph is still acyclic. So this claim is actually a contradiction to the fact that T is maximally acyclic. And what was the last assumption that we made that was problematic? Well, it was the assumption that we have these two vertices in T that are not connected. So this second contradiction induced by the fact that this claim is true shows that T is connected. Maybe this double contradiction is a little convoluted, so let's go through it again. So we first suppose that the graph T is maximally acyclic. And now we need to show that T is in fact connected. So we assume for the sake of contradiction that T is not connected. Then we can add this edge xy between two vertices that aren't connected to each other, and the result is still acyclic. But this is a contradiction to the fact that T was maximally acyclic, so in fact T has to be connected. All right, with that we've shown that 4 implies 1. And so we've closed this loop of implications, and this means that all of these statements are equivalent. And with that, we can declare that this proposition has been proven. Obviously, this isn't the only way one could have proved this theorem. One could have chosen different implications. And if one of the arguments that I uh, presented doesn't seem clear, then maybe you can try and uh, come up with a different argument for different implications. I hope what I was saying before about trees occupying this balancing point between a graph being connected and between it being acyclic makes more sense now. So if we have some tree T and we remove any edge, then after it will become disconnected. That's what the fact that it's minimally connected means. On the other hand, if we add any edge, then it'll become cyclic. And this fact is encapsulated by the statement that there exists a unique path connecting any two vertices in T. Okay, so I hope that this theorem has given you some intuition for thinking about trees. And moreover, in what's to come, this will be very useful that we can switch uh, between any of these statements when we're dealing with trees. In the next video, we'll be proving some more facts about trees, including how to recognize trees based solely on their number of vertices and edges.